Good afternoon from Washington. I'm Andrew Tabler, the Martin J. Gross Senior Fellow in the Linda and Tony Rubin Program on Arab Politics at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. And it is my pleasure today to welcome you to this very timely policy forum, Iranian Escalation in Iraq and Syria, Implications and U.S. Options. Since the Gaza war erupted on October 7th, Iran-backed militias have targeted U.S. forces in Iraq and eastern Syria more than 70, 70 times and counting, accelerating an already worrisome trend in 2023. To deter further attacks, Washington has ordered multiple strikes on militias' bases in Syria and Iraq. Yet, questions remain about the militias' intentions and the impact of these growing cycles of escalation and what they may have, including on U.S. deployments in the ongoing fight against the Islamic State. But to address these questions, we've assembled some of the best experts on the issues surrounding this concerning trend. First, we're going to hear from Michael Knights, the Institute's Bernstein Fellow and co-founder of its Militia Spotlight platform, which tracks and catalogs Iranian-backed proxies across Iraq and Syria. Second, uh, we are joined by Vladimir von Vil Vilgenberg from Erbil. He's a journalist and co-author of the book, The Kurds of Northern Syria, Governance, Diversity, and Conflicts, and is a contributor to the Institute's Fikra Forum. And then last but not least, we have Devorah Margolin, is the Institute's Blumenstein Rosenblum Fellow, focusing on terrorism governance, the role of women in violent extremism, and related issues. So before we begin uh, with Mike, uh, just a few bits of housekeeping. Uh, if you uh, and the, those listening would like to ask any questions of our panelists during the event, please enter them into the Zoom question and answer function at the bottom of your screens. If you, on the other hand, are watching this policy forum on our website or YouTube, feel free to email your questions to policy forum at washingtoninstitute.org. Again, policy forum at washingtoninstitute.org. Okay. Um, without further ado, Michael Knights, over to you. Thanks very much. Just check that you're hearing me okay. Yes, we do. Okay, great. And uh, I'll put up some slides and just uh, let me know if you are... Uh, seeing those okay we can see them. good yep all right well thanks very much for uh having me and for letting me kick off today and it's the delight to be here with uh Deborah and with vlad um vlad of course who uh i wrote the uh book accidental allies uh which is well worth going to check out at the washington institute website looking at the sdf's fight against islamic state uh, in uh, eastern Syria. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what kind of kinetic activity, so attacks, drone missile, or drone rockets, and perhaps missile, we've seen in Iraq and Syria. Um, the day's focus seems to, you know, is probably leaning towards Syria, and that's indeed where uh, the Islamic resistance in Iraq are, are kind of an umbrella claim brand that contains all the usual actors, Qatar, Bezbullah, and Assad al-Haq, US designated terrorist organizations, Qatar Said al-Shahada, um, Najaba, uh, another uh, US designated terrorist organization. They're all the same players, Assad al-Haq, uh, you know, and um, uh, probably a couple of others as well. But they're using this overall claiming term. And if you go to the Washington Institute's militia spotlight, you can see we've got a running tracker going that stays at a stable uh, URL. It's um, put out on Twitter a couple of times a day whenever it's updated, which will give you a kind of a tally of what's happening uh, in terms of what's being claimed, but either through the social media space or indeed eventually by the Islamic resistance in Iraq. Uh, and that's quite comprehensive and updated multiple times a day. Now, what are the trends? Um, well, slightly leaning towards counter US operations in Syria rather than Iraq. Uh, if you look at this map here, 
you can see that within Iraq, you know, we have the most targeted facility, Al Assad Air Base, in Ambar Province in western Iraq. We have uh, two locations in the Kurdistan region, north of that blue line, the internal KRG Iraqi border, uh, Erbil International Airport and Haria. Uh, and then we have some Baghdad targets too, only one of which has been struck very tentatively, BDSC at the Baghdad International Airport, Baghdad Diplomatic Security Center, and um, a support center. And, and that's, uh, you know, that's been largely left alone. In terms of what's happening inside Iraq, we see two main areas of responsibility. Uh, one is mirroring what, what is the Qatar Bezbollah Jazeera Operations Command uh, between Baghdad, south of the Euphrates, and can, include, including Western Anbar, and then being extended over into Al Tamf garrison in Syria and the Rukban crossing into Jordan. Qatar Bezbollah seems to handle the strikes in that area. Uh, whether it's rocket strikes short range against al-Assad from within Iraq, whether it's drone attacks from within Iraq or from within the Abu Kamal area uh, just north of the border, whether it's shorter range attacks on Tamf and Rukban from western Iraq, or whether it's longer range uh, drone attacks on uh, al-Tamf garrison uh, from the Al Abu Kamal area. That's very tidy. The Qatar Bezbollah is... Uh, seems to be claiming only attacks that are really happening with very few exceptions. And there's a minimum of monkey business there when it comes to trying to work out, uh, you know, how many attacks there's been. That's pretty clear, it's pretty tidy, and it's largely aimed, quite carefully aimed to be non-lethal from what we can see so far. Then there's a second uh, group of attacks inside Iraq, which are primarily happening out of Northern Iraq, and they are, the Najaba movement, Qatar side al Shahada, and probably some Asab al Haq mixed in with that as well, even though they don't exactly play well with others and they're not necessarily working all entirely within the Islamic resistance of Iraq claim structure. They're probably doing a bit of freelancing as well. Those northern launch zones, including places near Sinjar, places near Mosul, uh, north of Mosul, Mineral Plains, and the Kukuk area. Uh, when they're towards the western side, they probably also undertake some attacks into Syria, eastern Syria security area, like Shaddadi or the Ramaylan um, uh, uh, landing zone uh, right at the uh, at the top of the um, of the image. Uh, if that's not covered up by anything, uh, we also have some attacks by a variety of axis of resistance actors, probably including the Jabba and Qatar side or Shahada going across the Euphrates up into the, the more distant coalition targets uh, like Talbeda, Romalan uh, landing zone, often when we're seeing drone strikes. And it is Shadadi, again, when we're seeing drone strikes. If you're shooting from the Euphrates River Valley and you see the green line sort of roughly showing a line of, of division there between Syrian Defence Forces, uh, Democratic Forces held positions north of the river and and uh, axis of resistance south of the river. Um, you know, you're not going to be able to hit places like Talbeda and Ramalan and Shadadi with drones, with a, a rocket system. You're going to need a drone system to do that. So we're obviously getting some drone coming out of Euphrates River Valley. We're also getting a lot of short range rocket system going across the Euphrates, like 107, 122 millimeter, uh, going at uh, US bases uh, in uh, the Conoco uh, area, MSS Euphrates, uh, and also in the Omar oil field area, MSS Green Village. And, you know, sometimes that's being done short range from east of the Euphrates, which Vlad's going to probably talk about a bit. Sometimes it's aimed at the US, sometimes it's aimed at SDF facilities nearby, and working out which to count or not count as anti-US attacks is a challenge. Uh, so, you know, we, we have some stuff coming across the Euphrates, some stuff actually being fired from east of the Euphrates, close in uh, to bases. Most of the retaliation has fallen, as you see those little explosive markers, it, in the Euphrates River Valley inside Syria. That's uh, three airstrikes that the US has undertaken, but it's also a number of counter-battery artillery missions that the US has fired of an indeterminate number 
which the US does not seem to be openly reporting in the same way that it would report airstrikes. You know, we know from many previous experiences that when the US undertakes an airstrike in retaliation, it's often a target that's preloaded to the aircraft that's overhead, and then the strike is undertaken. Or uh, it may well be a, a strike that's loaded, the aircraft takes off, they go do the operation. That's also possible. Um, they tend to report those. What doesn't seem to be being reported are purely defensive actions, e.g., you know, these are actions in the heat of the moment to stop an attack and kill the attackers. And that kind of stuff is not being counted as closely. We're detecting some of it. Um, but again, it's a very complicated environment there in the Eastern Syria security area. Um, I'd say just to finish off, you know, in Lebanon and Israel border fighting and Golan type stuff with Israel, people talk about the rules of the game and that they're quite well understood by Lebanese Hezbollah and Israel. And it can kind of seem a little perverse. You know, it's OK to kill someone that side of the road, but not that side of the road. You know, it's an escalation if you go that far, but not that far. Um, it's very much the same with US and Iran. I mean, for a number of years now, large since 2017 but particularly since 2019 you know we have been building a tacit set of rules um that allow us to say whether something is kind of normal harassment activity by the iran-backed militias or whether it's something that we want to retaliate to i did a lot of work in the past on how we how we scaled this and created our response ratios in for instance no fly zones against saddam's constant air defenses against us in the 90s and how we've done it more recently against attackers like Iraq, Iran-backed militias in Iraq and Syria. Um, you know, what's clear is that it has a qualitative element. If there's too many bangs within a certain period, the US is more likely to strike back. But it's typically triggered by a qualitative element, not a quantitative element. So, you know, something that seems to be particularly risky or deadly, something that was deliberately intended to kill, Use the new sophisticated capability in a way that increased lethality, not decreased lethality, because, of course, more accurate systems can be used to reliably not kill Americans in these attacks. And that has been the case um, in the last few years and in the last few weeks. Um, but, you know, in March of 2023, when we saw a drone strike go into the Romalan landing zone there in the north, we hit back immediately and with deadly effect. Why? because we saw some qualitative changes and we saw lethality uh, in that attack and with one American killed and lucky not to have lost more. We're now right on the edge of a significant US retaliation that may not be limited to the Syrian environment uh, if we see that combination of a US fatality and some factors that suggest this was intentional or reckless so for instance just uh, recently in the last few days we saw 15 122 millimeter rockets shot at uh, conoco and we hit back uh why uh, because that kind of thing looks like probing it looks like pushing the envelope and seeing how reckless they can be before we'll hit back and that's the kind of behavior we want to dissuade risk-taking behavior and it's been a little quieter since then but there'll probably be another wave of risk-taking to test our tolerances in the same way that Lebanese Hezbollah is not only testing Israel's tolerances uh, on the northern border there, but also testing whether the U.S. is restraining Israel's tolerance and changing US, Israel's tolerance levels. Uh, so there'll be constant testing, and we are on the edge of a significant uh, uh, of a significant intensification or escalation. If someone makes a mistake, uh, or is seen to have done something on purpose, they did by accident. Over. Great. Um, thanks, Mike. Um, very comprehensive as usual. Um, lots of good questions I've written down here for you, but let's wait a little bit on that. Uh, Vladimir, uh, moving over to you out in the field. Take it away. Yeah, thank you uh, for hosting me uh, for this uh, interesting conference. And as what Mike also said, uh, we wrote a book together, but it's not very clear, but <laughs> I had it with me. Um, 
So yeah, I want to talk. I just uh, wrote a piece uh, for the FICRA forum on the situation in uh, the resort. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the um, the situation in um, in the resort and basically the insurgency challenge for Kurdish-led SDF. So as you can see here on the map, it's one of the maps from the, the book of me and uh, Michael Knights. You see that the Kurds initially only wanted to connect the areas between Afrin uh, and Derik, but they were not so much interested in areas like Raqqa or Deir Azor or other areas because they were a majority Arab. So they were more interested in creating like a continuous uh, small Kurdish-led autonomous area. But this was like hampered by uh, Turkish military campaigns between 2016 and 2019, but also by the fact that the U.S., uh, after they created an alliance with the U.S. In, uh, during the Kobani battle, um, the U.S. was pushing the, the SDF to go towards Raqqa and towards Deir Azor. So Raqqa is different from Deir Azor because there's a small uh, Kurdish population in Raqqa and in Deir Azor it's uh, mainly uh, Arabic, it's basically majority Arab, there's no Kurds there. So, I mean, the main tribes in Deir Azor, the Bagara tribe and the Agadat tribe, um, but there were no Kurds there. So as a result, they were forced to work uh, with an unpopular figure, Abu Khawla, from uh, the Bakir clan, which is also part of the Bagara tribal confederation. And he was very, uh, he was not very popular and he didn't have like a, a tribal lineage, like a, he was not from a sheikh uh, from a higher level of the, of the tribes. And uh, he came from a clan that also joined ISIS in the past. And the SDF used Abu Khawla, basically making him the head of the Derezor military council uh, because they needed someone from Derezor. And um, and it was always difficult for, for the SDF to work in Derezor because unlike in Raqqa, I mean, most of the tribes, they didn't were not used to uh, a Kurdish uh, control uh, over Deir Ezzor. And also, if you maybe remember, in 2004, there were clashes between two football teams, a uh, Kurdish football team and a team from Deir Ezzor. So there also was like um, resentment in the past between Deir Ezzor and uh, people and Kurds. Um, so in, in the end, like uh, the SDF, with, with the help of the US-led coalition, they took Deir Ezzor. And after that, uh, Deir Ezzor was basically split in two regions, one controlled by the SDF with all the oil, uh, the Omar field, uh, the Omar field, the coconut, uh, coconut gas field. So these areas that are now constantly under attack by Iranian back groups. And then you had the West Bank with uh, Mayadeen and the city of Deir Ezzor. Um, but as I mentioned, Abu Khawla was not very popular. Uh, there were like already protests against him in 2020 when his brother was accused of killing two girls. Uh, and also uh, in Deir Ezzor itself, there were always like, there was always unrest or ISIS attacks still. There were like uh, protests about the services uh, against the SDF. And also even in 2020, when a tribal leader was assassinated, uh, Ibrahim Ahifol, uh, the one of the leaders, the main leader of the Agudat tribe in uh, Deir Ezzor, he called for the tribes to control uh, Deir Ezzor and basically have the tribes have their own administration separate from the SDF. And this is already in 2020. And one of the main reasons also for that is that the tribes, they wanted to control the oil by themselves. And when the SDF came in with the US-led coalition, they had to basically share the oil of Deir Ezzor with the other areas under SDF control. And also there are other issues like a lack of jobs, services, problems with water, agriculture. I mean, also there's the issue of uh, climate change. So there's always uh, problems with water. Um, so there was always like protests and unrest, uh, ISIS cells, uh, but also Syrian regime cells. Uh, Turkey also had an interest to undermine the SDF, which they see as, as, uh, as the PKK basically. And Turkey did many operations against the SDF. But what I said before is that if you look on the map, um, Turkey is very far from Deir Ezzor. So it had very difficult for, for Turkey to influence that. Unlike, for instance, where Tel Abyad or Mombic, where Turkey has more influence on, on uh, Arabs. Uh, so, the, so Turkey was very far, but the regime was very close by on the other side of the river. So they had more... Um, they had more chances basically to cross, uh, to make instability in Deir Ezzor. Uh, but the issue was that the, most people of Deir Ezzor, they preferred um, the SDF or the US over the Syrian regime. So the SDF was not very popular, but till, till now the population of Deir Ezzor, they prefer um, the US especially, but also the SDF over the Syrian regime. 
Um, but um, these uh, grievances of the Arabs over Kurdish control over Deir Azor, uh, this created um, uh, a big insurgency uh, in the summer. So already in July, there were rumors that Abu Khawla would be removed and there were some small uh, incidents, but Abu Khawla then dismissed the claims that he would be removed. But then on August 27, finally, the SDF, they arrested Abu Khawla and then his brother started to lead a, a revolt in Suwar. So initially, the revolt in that resort was mostly uh, limited to the areas of the Bakir clan around Suwar. But then after uh, a hard response from the SDF and allegations of civilian casualties, the revolt also spread to Diban, Diban which is the stronghold of Sheikh Ibrahim al hifo from the Agadat tribe. So when he joined uh, the revolt, it became more serious. And also Ibrahim al hifo was not a friend of Abu Khawla because a, a voice recording was leaked that showed that Abu Khawla was insulting uh, Ibrahim al hifo in an audio recording because Abu Khawla wanted to create alternatives to the traditional uh, tribal leaders by creating his own small environment. So uh, also Turkish back groups during this revolt attacked and there were around 76 people killed. But as I mentioned before, it was too far away from that resort to make an influence. So in the end, uh, this stopped. And also Turkey didn't support these Turkish back groups with the Air Force because they didn't want to um, uh, break the, um, the agreement with Russia from 2019. Uh, but attacks, they continued uh, because Ibrahim Hifal, when the SDF took the ban uh, from Ibrahim Hifal, so almost in a week of fighting, almost more than a week, the fighting was over and the SDF, they took control of all the areas. Ibrahim Hifal, he fled to the West Bank of the regime held areas. And since then, he has been calling for more attacks on the SDF and attempts by the US to bring in uh, Musab al Hifo, who is the um, uh, Qatar based uh, tribal leader of, of the Iqbidat tribe. Until now, they didn't uh, succeed in bringing the, the tribe of uh, or the clan of Hifol uh, to cool down the situation. But in the end, I think the tribal insurgency failed against the Arab for uh, two main reasons. First of all, not the majority of all the Arabs joined uh, the revolt in Derezor. Maybe 30% of Derezor joined, which is mostly, mostly the clan, the Bouchamil clan of Sheikh al Hifol and the Bakir clan of Abu Khawla from the Iqadat. But the majority of the tribes, they didn't join. And you saw also after the Diban, uh, revolt basically uh, was crushed. Other areas like near Hajin and stuff, they quickly came under the SEF without any fight. Um, but an interesting element also is that, as I said, that the regime is closer to the Deir uh, areas of the SEF than, for instance, Turkey. So what you saw, for instance, this is a picture showing Ibrahim Hifol uh, stamping on an SDF flag with uh, Uncle Sam. So this shows that the regime, they had an interest in supporting this insurgency against uh, the SDF. Uh, signs that the regime, they supported the insurgencies. First of all, there were a lot of rumors and also reports that Abu Khawla initially wanted to remove the SDF with regime support because he knew that the SDF wanted to remove him. So this is one of the reasons that the SDF uh, moved first against Abu Khawla before he could make a move against the SDF. But as I said, the revolt, that's why in the beginning was mostly Abu Khawla's area, but then it quickly spread to Diban. And in the beginning also, uh, there was some form of popular support for the insurgency. But uh, when Ibrahim Hifol, after September, uh, in the beginning of September, moved to the regime areas, it showed more and more that the regime was getting involved in the insurgency. And this was also shown, for instance, that uh, NDF members from the National Defense Forces, a pro-regime militia, were captured by the SDF and they had confessions. But also other groups like the Eastern Lions, they joined basically under the tribal revolt. They joined uh, the fight against the SDF. So, for instance, you saw also Hashem al satam There was a video of him. He's a commander of an Iranian back group. He crossed the river um, and he joined the fight against the SDF. So this also, while in the beginning of the insurgency, so there was not support for Abu Khawla, but there were a lot of grievances. You see that um, the popular support for the insurgency is is going down because it's it's more clear from recent attacks in October and other attacks that the regime is getting more involved. And you see that also on Facebook. Yeah, for instance, the sons of the Jazeera and the Euphrates movement they continuously uh, post videos of attacks uh, against the SDF. And now also you have the conflict in Gaza, so there's more um, unrest in in that resort. So you have also the drone attacks, the rocket attacks. And also there's a lot of reports, for instance, there was a report in an Arabic uh, it's news website that now the regime is supporting this Arab insurgency and Sheikh Ibrahim al 
from the area around uh, Mayadin under uh, under regime control. And you also saw that the U.S. warned against malign actors. So with that, they mean they warned Arab tribal leaders not to work with malign actors. So that's like a sign that the regime, according to from the U.S. perspective, is also uh, supporting this insurgency. And also what I heard also is that a lot of uh, civil society organizations that also receive support from the U.S., they are receiving threatening messages, uh, messages from the regime side. Um, so what I want to say as a concluding remarks is that it's very difficult for the SDF uh, to control the area around Diban uh, if um, Ibrahim Hifel is not brought back to, De to the SDF held areas of Derazor, but now he's under house arrest or he's under regime control. So it's very difficult um, to get this part of uh, Derazor under control in Diban. So you see all the time the recent insurgents attacks there around Diban. And it's very easy also, it's very difficult for the SDF to control the, the river that is separating the regime areas and the SDF areas. So there should be a sort of a solution, for instance, to bring, for instance, the Qatar-based uh, Musab al-Hifo, who is actually the, the real leader of the Gadat tribe to, to their resort to basically cool down the situation. But it's very difficult because Ibrahim Hifo is now under regime control. Um, but the U.S. presence basically prevents the collapse of the SDF because without... Uh, without air power, the, these uh, tribal insurgents cannot defeat the SDF. And now, especially also with the conflict uh, between Hamas and Israel, there's more incentive also for Iran and the regime to destabilize that Azor. And also they want the U.S. to be removed from uh, from that Azor. Both Iran and the regime, they want the U.S. to leave that Azor. So that's why there's more incentive for them also to uh, sponsor these uh, insurgents attacks on the SDF. So also another point that I wanted to make also, the U.S., they always say our mission is only against ISIS. So still, there is also a fear among many uh, locals that at some point the U.S. will leave because they could see the, the ISIS is defeated and then they will leave the area. So this also makes it more difficult for tribal leaders or other people uh, to support uh, the SDF because they always fear that at some point um, the U.S. could drop the SDF, as was seen, for instance, in 2019 when the U.S. sort of greenlighted the Turkish operation in Tel Abiyat and uh, Serekania, but also, for instance, in 2017, when the U.S. didn't support the uh, Iraqi Kurdish referendum and allowed Iranian backed uh, groups and the Iraqi army to take disputed territories from the Kurds. So the Arab tribes, they thought that the U.S. will maybe not support Kurds until the end. So there is a need for a U.S. strategy basically beyond the anti-ISIS mission. But as long as these grievances uh, persist and there's not a very uh, clear uh, U.S. strategy beyond the anti-ISIS mission, there will always be uh, more uh, room for the regime and also for uh, Iran to basically exploit uh, grievances of uh, Arabs in that zone. Thank you. Okay. Very comprehensive also. Thank you so much. Um, Devora, over to you. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you to, to Mike and Vlad for being here today as well. I'm here to talk about the ISIS encounter, ISIS angle, what the Islamic State's been up to a bit before and after October 7th, the ongoing status of repatriations, uh, and I'll end with a little bit of the known unknowns or things we need to pay attention to. Before October 7th, ISIS was continuing since 2019 to operate a shadow governance in Northeast Syria. My colleague Aaron Zellin and I recently published a piece in CTC Sentinel about this, about how the groups not only attempted to survive, but also worked to really create the conditions to return to its territorial control. When we look at the numbers of ISIS claimed attacks and even the counter operations, it doesn't always tell us the whole story. And so we really emphasize that it's important to look at what's happening on the ground, how ISIS is collecting taxes, operating moral policing units, administering documents and retaking territory, even if only briefly. What this shows is that the group's governance attempts illustrate that the Islamic State may be stronger than many assume. And it highlights that ISIS has never given up its desire to want to control and govern territory. I think it's also important as we talk about the wake of October 7th, what the ISIS-Hamas relationship is. And it should be very, very clear, there is no love lost between these groups. They are not friends. The Islamic State is against Hamas. It believes that it is an apostate group due to its nationalist agenda. Um, and for the Islamic State, when it talks about Palestine, it is first and foremost uh, focusing on 
Arab states apostate rule in the Middle East. So thinking about Syria and Iraq, that is their first agenda. Um, and then Palestine and other uh, territories that were conquered by non-Muslim uh, lands are then the second priority. So while they did call for local Palestinian uprisings uh, before October 7th in the Palestinian arena, um, they weren't calling for people and supporters to travel to the area. Um, if we look at their claimed attacks, there's only been a few in 2017 and 2020. Uh, I will give a little shout out to Cole Bunsley, who's done some really great work on this as well. When we look at the Islamic State's response to October 7th, I think what's really, really interesting is there is no explicit chatter or reference to October 7th or even to Hamas itself. In late October, in Al-Naba, uh, issue 413, the group issued an article titled Practical Steps to Fight the Jews. It insulted the Palestinian uh, alliance with Iran. It says it was legitimate to attack all Jews, not just in Israel, specifically focusing on North America and Europe. It calls for attacks in apostate states surrounding Israel. Um, and it argues that its method is the only proper way to liberate Palestine. So it really talked about Hamas and the October 7th attack without explicitly talking about the events. What's interesting is that if we look at the attacks claimed by the group uh, since October 7th, we have seen no major uptick in ISIS claimed attacks since then. then both ISIS claimed attacks and IS attacks reported by the Rojava Information Center are actually way down in 2023 compared to previous years. And the larger attacks have actually that have happened since October 7th have actually been mostly in regime held areas. There's also been no major uh, prison or detention center uprisings or attacks. The last major riot, of course, was in January 2023. But we've seen some small protests in a hole this week and attempted breakout by a teenager. But these are completely unrelated to the events of October 7th. We've also seen a continued repatriation of Iraqi citizens from Al Hol to uh, back to Iraq. In 2023 alone, we've seen 3,200 uh, individuals. Uh, which is almost half of the number of people that have been repatriated since 2021. Uh, we've also seen about 200 prisoners repatriated. When looking at third country nationals repatriations, we are actually at the highest year yet, 590 repatriations in 2023 from 13 countries. Nearly all of them are women and children. And only Russia and Kyrgyzstan have repatriated since October 7th. I would say that overall, despite the international attention, ISIS is trucking along, and so are counter-ISIS counter operations. According to CENTCOM, through October 31st, uh, we've seen 87 partnered operations with the SDF, um, including 20 ISIS operatives killed and 288 arrested. This is up. Uh, this In 2022, we saw about 180 partner operations. So we're actually on track to about the same stats as we had in 2022. The coalition, the SDF, are also continuing their counter ISIS operations, including arrests of high ranking leaders, including one who, earlier this month who helped plan the Hoska prison attacks. So, what does this all mean for the US and the coalition? What are the known unknowns that we need to pay attention to? First, it's not just the US and the region. Obviously, the US is the main target of the Iranian militias at the moment, but the coalition is made up of over 80 states. And how does this affect them as well? We also need to think about the deflecting of attention. Obviously, bad actors are trying to distract and destabilize, as we can see. I will hope that Andrew will address this a little bit, but talking about Syrian normalization, what does that mean? There was a lot of talk a couple of months ago about bringing Syria back into the fold. Where do we stand on that today? There's also questions of the SDF stabilization, which Vlad very, uh, talked about very well. Things that are taking away from the SDF's mission uh, to counter ISIS. That's third party forces, possible Turkish incursions, Russia, and now Iranian militias. Also internal strifes and cries for attention. A couple months ago, we saw the Autonomous Administration for North and East Syria talk about possibly doing trials of third country nationals. We haven't seen any movement on this. And now there's more attention taking away from the cause as well. There's also the tribal issues, as Wada mentioned. And there's the ongoing insurgency. The uh, Operation Inherent Resolve report that just came out uh, a couple weeks ago, again, called ISIS degraded, but operating in survival mode. Um, I think 
Two final points. One is climate change and natural disasters, which Vlad again mentioned, uh, is extremely important. I think this is such an under talked about issue. But when people are fighting for resources on the ground, it's going to be a big part of the conversation that we need to have. Um, and finally, how can, you know, we've talked a lot about this possible U.S. withdrawal. Uh, can the coalition survive without ISIS? What is the end of defeating ISIS? Is it the military end of defeating ISIS? Is it the end of all repatriations? At the rate we're going, it's going to be a few years until that happens anyways. Um, but there also might be some domestic attitude changes in the U.S. If U.S. Uh, forces are continuously targeted, will support for the continued mission um, happen or will U.S. attitudes change internally? And I think the final point is thinking about how Iraqi attitudes will change. If uh, U.S forces are being targeted in Syria and in Iraq, will Iraq still want U.S. forces there? And with that, I will hand it over to Andrew. Great. Um, thank you so much, Devorah. Um, I'll just make a, some a few uh, remarks, um, partially based off of the some of the panelists, and then we'll go to um, questions and answers. So just to remind everyone, if you would like to ask questions of our panelists during this event, please enter them into the Zoom Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and if you're watching this policy forum on our website or YouTube, uh, feel free to email your questions to policyforum at washingtoninstitute.org. So just a few comments. Um, first, I think that the, uh, the, the recent attacks on US forces in Syria and Iraq are significant. Uh, Mike Mike Knight's uh, recent, he has a daily update or a tracker on Militia Spotlight. Uh, we're upwards of 74, 75, I believe, attacks by our count today. I think the Pentagon talked about um, a lower number, but of course they, these things are cataloged in different ways and considered in different ways, but still we're well up over 50, let's say, from their counts. We also have the announcements of uh, those U.S. service members or contractors that are injured, I believe that the final count was that it all, all told is about 59, I think it was announced yesterday, all of whom have returned to service. So in a way, that's really good news that the U.S. has been able to uh, to deal with these attacks till now, that it hasn't led to, um, to, to serious injury um, in that regard. And that doesn't, as Dev talked about, interrupt or get into the political ramifications of this. But um, I think as Mike's tracker very closely um, shows, it, it's not just the number of attacks that are occurring, but the involvement of more, the greater involvement of drones and greater lethality um, leads to um, the possibility um, for, um, for incidents that can lead to the loss of life. And then also not only further US strikes, but also a potential calls in the US during an election year to withdraw um, from that space. I, I think that that is what these groups intend to do politically. Um, and I'm gonna ask some of our panelists a little bit about what they're seeing, particularly Mike, but not only. Um, I think it's very worrisome because this then coincides with um, what Vladimir was talking about of the uprising uh, of, or the revolt of uh, some of the tribes in Eastern Syria. Um, it's been well discussed about the Iranian and Russian, Iranian, Russian and regime roles in trying to stir the pot for the SDF out in Eastern Syria. As Vladimir talked about, the SDF is um, uh, militarily uh, well-placed given their involvement with the United States in defeating uh, the Islamic State to act in those areas. But uh, these are not areas of, of natural demographic strength uh, to them. They're Arab tribal areas traditionally and, and, area, and areas where there is some resentment against the SDF leadership that the, our American adversaries uh, try and take advantage of. So I think that's another uh, part of what is the intention behind these these current activities. Now, the degree to which it's all tied together and linked up to the Gaza crisis is an interesting one. Some have uh, 
talked about this being part of a sort of well sewn up Iranian operation in order to defeat uh, or to encircle Israel, to harass it um, in a way and, uh, and to get it chasing its own tail so that therefore, and then it sucks the United States in and causes a regional crisis. I, I think that that um, that part to me is not clear. I do think though that the Iranians see the U.S. and Israel as in a very close alliance. Uh, also, maybe in terms of so close and sometimes that they're virtually the same. Uh, I think, though, that they, the Iranians understand very well, uh, as does the Assad regime and others, that the U.S. is sensitive to injuries and to deaths um, of American personnel. And therefore, uh, during this time of a, um, another presidential election, which may or may not be close, we don't know, um, but certainly one where it's going to be, it appears to be a redux of the last, um, of the last election um, uh, between President Biden and perhaps um, uh, Donald Trump. Um, it's going to, I think there's a real effort to try and see, is there a way to get the United States uh, to leave that area? And I think that's the Iranians and the, and, and the Russians in particular have been very, been very, very clear about that. Um, I think it's a very, wor- I think it's very worrisome for the fight against the Islamic State, because in the event, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, in the event that there is a precipitous withdrawal of withdrawal of the United States from positions in Syria or in Iraq, um, I think the ability of the and maybe the willingness of the Assad regime and the Iranians to uh, to keep ISIS down um, and to quote solve that problem. I think is extremely remote, and so therefore would only lead to its regeneration uh, later, um, and that I think would threaten U.S. security, and it's an outcome that we need to do the most we can uh, to avoid. So those are just my 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 brief comments. Um, oh, uh, Deborah, you talked about normalization. Uh, I think the normalization debate and the outcomes of that debate over the last year have uh, come to their natural um, situation. Um, I think they've gone relatively nowhere. Uh, Most of that is because of the Assad regime's rigidity. Their idea of uh, engagement is for uh, things to go back to the way they were before uh, and uh, for people to bend to the Assad regime's position. Uh, Like the sort, it's the sort of, um, you know, clock, a stop clock is right twice a day, and at least a manual clock. And so, therefore, um, so therefore, they think that that things are coming around to their way of thinking. I I don't think that that's the case. Um, I think the Captagon uh, issue has been front and center in that, um, and I think it's I think it's quite worrisome. Uh, I think what this current trend shows, though, is that while Israel and Hamas are battling it out uh, over uh, the October 7th attacks and their aftermath. Um, the way that Iran and its supporters can escalate with the Israeli American alliance, so to speak, uh, is in that trade space in Syria. And I think Michael Knight's talked about, we're going to get to this a little bit later about the, the rules of the game in Syria. It's in Syria where um, there is the greatest freedom of action of the different parties in the region, but also internationally. And the rules of the game there are the most malleable um, uh, as opposed to other locked and loaded fronts like between Israel and Lebanon, for example, um, but not only. So anyway, just just a few comments. Um, I have a, we have some comments coming in from the, from the audience. We have about 15 minutes, um, but Mike, let me ask you in your tracker, of course, we've had other drone attacks in 2023, uh, including one that was in March, which was quite devastating. But we've, we've been noticing greater use of drones in the current situation as opposed to rockets, although rockets are also being used in case of missile, I believe, in limited occasions. Can you talk to us a little bit about what we know about these drones that are attacking these positions? Is this a major change? Um, does it introduce, introduce a significant lethality uh, into uh, into this conflict, or 
are these, as some have argued, kind of not pinpricks, but uh, attempts to harass the United States, but but not to hit us where it hurts? Yeah, sure. Um, so drones bring predictability. Uh, and as a result, you know, some in the US government have viewed them as being not an escalation, but a de-escalation. Now, others feel very uncomfortable with that characterization, especially the people at the receiving end, because, you know, you are only a decision away, a targeting decision away from a drone being a de-escalatory step if it's aimed off of areas likely to contain US personnel or an escalatory step if they choose to flip it the other way. And, um, you know, I'll just say this, uh, linking it all together, the strategic and the tactical, you know, this crisis was not fine-tuned by Iran, probably, and it's got, it's, it's, it's evolved in different ways from where they expected it and from the way Hamas expected it and Hezbollah. Uh, you know, the, the overall direction is de-escalatory. You know, the grown-ups in the room here are the Iranian government and the US government. And they are trying to prevent this from broadening. But there are some less predictable actors. Um, in some ways, Israel is one of those, and potentially so is Lebanese as Bolo. Uh, they have their own interests and they may be acting emotionally and they, you know, they're things they care about that America or Iran doesn't care about even. Uh, some of the outlier militias involved in Iraq might have some leeway to be disrupted. They might say, uh, actually, we want a debate in Iraq about removing US forces. We'd kind of like them to hit us back in Iraq. And, uh, you know, that's, that's something we need to think about. For instance, and we're going to know if they hit the US embassy, that some of those outliers have decided we want to go further than we've even been allowed to go so far. But, you know, a, a, an unpredictable outlier is a rocket. You know, 15 rockets against the US base is just the kind of unpredictability we don't like. Even if you're aiming to miss, you can miss. As we saw, you know, we, uh, in February 2021, we had a spray of about, about the same size of rockets went into Erbil, a heavily populated city. And it was very, very dangerous what happened. So, you know, for us, I think overall, drone means predictability and control. The other end is trying to have some fine-grained control, and it's probably trying to limit our fatalities. Drone is also something which we don't understand exactly how effective we are at it, because that's still classified, but where we probably have some quite capable, quite a lot of effect, potentially. And um, so I think we're more comfortable with drone, and I think we're less comfortable with large rocket salvos, and that's why we kicked off after Conoco uh, the other night. And I guess this just all goes to underlining grown-ups, US and Iran, are trying to keep this under control, but there's a lot of uncontrolled actors in this space and uncontrolled weapons uh, that can push us over the edge accidentally, I think. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, Vladimir, you have a piece... I believe it's coming out in Ficker Forum, or is it out yet? I don't know. I tried to look at the site today, it's but I wasn't out. sure if it was out. Is it out? Okay. Yeah, well, already... um, you know, tying all of your presentation to what you think is are the, and this gets us into the questions from the audience as well, concerning what what is it that the Iranians are after here in stirring the pot in eastern Syria? What do we know about that in short? Is it just rumors? Uh, have these things surfaced more recently? Um, how do you differentiate the Iranian intentions there vis-a-vis -vis the tribes and others versus the regime versus the Russians and others that are in alliance with Assad? Can Is there a way to discern that clearly or is it really a lot of rumint uh, or assumptions. Mm -hmm. Well, but the, fir the first thing which you mentioned is like sometimes it's very difficult to make a difference between if it's Iran or the regime, because you have like these militias that, that are sort of operating under the radar. So as I mentioned, you have, they call every group now attacking the SDF tribal forces. 
but you have like the Eastern Lions, uh, which is an Iranian, uh, the Eastern Lions, you have the NDF, you have these sort of militia groups that are basically backed by Iran. You, you have like someone like, for instance, Nawaf al-Bashir, like a tribal leader uh, that is backed by, by Iran. So basically, uh, it's very difficult to see what uh, what is which group. But in the end, they are um, both Iran and also Damascus. They have the same interest, which is pushing out the U.S. from Syria. So if they could create uh, instability in the SDFL areas in Deir Ezzor, they could uh, make it the presence of the U.S. Uh, forces uh, very difficult. Because as you saw in the beginning of the insurgency, all the areas around the U.S. bases, they were basically controlled by tribal insurgents. So if the if they manage to keep that up and continue attacking, it make it very difficult for the U.S. for some logistically also to move in that resort, because in that first in the first battle uh, in in um, in August and September, like all the U.S. bases around it, they were all controlled by uh, anti SDF forces, uh, anti SDF forces. So it's very difficult for uh, for the U.S. then to maintain their logistical support uh, for the bases because they can fly into those bases. Uh, with helicopters and planes and etc. But if the uh, the landscape is controlled by anti-SDF insurgents, it's very difficult to maintain a presence there. Um, and then, of course, now it's getting even more complicated because you also have these rocket attacks uh, and you have the drone attacks, uh, what, uh, what Mike mentioned. Uh, and every time the U.S. hits uh, these Iranian uh, backgrouped or the IRGC, uh, locations in that resort so, so far three times. Every time after such an attack, you see rockets coming from Mayadeen and, and, and other areas targeting the Omer oil field and uh, the Green Village and other areas in that resort. So the thing now with the Gaza war, it's getting even more complicated. It's like a very uh, potent mix. And it's also difficult to see who's uh, stirring the pot, who makes the final decision on moving things. And you also see, as I mentioned before, that those for pro-regime militias, they're acting under the cover of tribal insurgency. But in fact, there are different uh, armed groups that are supported by uh, Iran and the regime. Uh, and the main purpose of it all is basically to push push out the US uh, from Syria, which all, all these actors want. Also Russia, Iran, uh, Damascus, they want the US out of Syria, and even Turkey wants the US out of Syria. And then I also I wanted to make an, another comment, which is not related to my piece. Like even some of these attacks that recently the uh, on the Erbil airport, actually one of the drones there was a report about in the Wall Street Journal that the drone almost exploded inside the base and almost killed um, U.S. soldiers. So as Mike mentioned, sometimes these drones they can have a, a large casualty rate. And this this case it was just luck that the drone load didn't explode, otherwise we would have like uh, US casualties and then probably a bigger US response. Uh, so it's not always clear that if these drones they are aimed to kill or not, but I think in some cases they're actually aimed to kill. And also there's been some reports that sometimes they do drones um, in two time zones. So for instance, they fire drones uh, in, in the morning and then they, they fire again in the afternoon. So the people, they hide, the, the soldiers they can hide and then there's another drone attack. So it seems that uh, that the aim is getting more lethal, basically. They're, they're, it seems that they're actually trying to kill, um, in some cases, they're trying to kill uh, coalition uh, forces. And also, we should keep in mind that this, uh, some of these bases, they don't only include U.S. soldiers. I mean, for instance, the Erbil Air Base, it's, it's full of different countries. I mean, the, the Netherlands, Germans, Italians, Hungarians, a lot of different um, coalition partners are there. And as Mike also mentioned, there's the civilian airport. So it's also very dangerous for instance, even if a drone gets shot out of the air, the drone could also land in a civilian space. So it's it's quite dangerous that these drone attacks uh, continue. And also, you already see some airliners, they canceled flights to Erbil, like Austrian Airlines and Eurowings. So it's also disrupting civilian traffic in Erbil. But that's why you see more attacks, I think, also on Harir, because the area around Harir military airport is like, uh, it's an empty sort of agricultural land. And then close to it, you have like a small town called Harir, but there's less chance of civilian casualties uh, around Harir. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Do you have anything to add? To, to... No, I think they... Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, so let's go to some of the questions from the from the audience. So um, I'm going to combine a couple of here. First of all, um, does the war in Gaza make Iran more or less aggressive? when it comes to attacks in Syria and Iraq? Uh, we talked about the numbers, but your overall impressions. Um, 
And, um, and then I think, you know, associated with that, what would represent a significant enough escalation in Iraq for the U.S. to retaliate against Iran-backed militias there as opposed to in Syria? So, Mike, maybe you'd like to t- take first stab at it? Sure. Um, and, you know, one thing to mention about what, what Vlad said about that, that um, whether it was Wall Street Journal or New York Times report that, that talked about the drone that hit a U.S. housing location, that was the first night of the strikes, and it was hot on the heels of the Al Ali hospital uh, explosion. And what we need to watch out for is one of those kind of moments, because you know that night, if you're an Iraqi militia, you could probably get away with pretty much anything, uh, just because of how high the emotion was that night and the possible unlikelihood of the US striking back immediately. So you know. Though that was a really dangerous moment where someone probably did take a chance uh, with killing some Americans, figuring they, they're going to get a pass for that. Um, since then, it's not really been the case. Uh, I think hitting the embassy in uh, or hitting the, the airport uh, hard in Baghdad, those things might shake loose of retaliation inside Iraq, particularly if they caused a fatality or one or more. Um, Lethal attack in um, Erbil or Haria that had some qualitative element, you know, that suggested deliberate, uh, you know, that that as well, or or in or in Al Assad. I mean, you know, that's. I think the warning's already gone across. Uh, you know, you cause uh, U.S. fatalities. There's a possibility we're striking back inside Iraq, and uh, against leadership uh, inside Iraq, and I think that's the right way to go. And I think we need to follow through if it happens. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's see here. Uh, let's address that already. Um, I think there's I get a couple of questions here about the sort of predicate maybe of this entire conversation. And Dev, you, you touched on it perhaps more in the domestic political realm, but um, what are the real risks here of the U.S. to U.S. interests of of a U.S. force withdrawal from Syria and Iraq? You obviously focus on the fight against the Islamic State, but I think that, to me, I think that's the in, the strategic intention of our adversaries is to drive us from that space, um, which we entered in this most recent round to fight um, terrorism. Um, how do you see this? Like, what? How do you? How do you see the stars aligning um, as a part of this, both in terms of internationally, which we've been talking about, but also how does that play out in the domestic politics we have in this country concerning deployments? Yeah, I think, as you mentioned, you know, the U.S. has used the counter ISIS campaign as the main reason for why uh, troops and interests are still in the region. Uh, but that is not obviously the only interest in the region. Um, some of our colleagues work here on energy and oil and other factors that uh, do deal with U.S. interests in the region. Also, greater stability of the Middle East is extremely important to the U.S. Um, when the Middle East is stable, the U.S. can pivot and look at other areas as well. Um, I think that the appetite for staying specifically in Syria and Iraq is lower, uh, even with this current administration. Um, I think you had hinted at it before. If there is a return of former President Trump to uh, the presidency, he's made it extremely clear that he will leave the region um, and what that will mean for the stability. I think what's also interesting is that the U.S. forces are currently in Iraq at the invitation of the Iraqi government. Um, And I think both Mike and Vlad really hit on this as well, right? What does this mean for other interests in Iraq other than the current administration? Um, And do they want uh, the U.S. to stay in Iraq um, and use it as a base as well? Um, There's a lot of conflicting domestic issues in Iraq right now. Um, And again, we're we're at a very interesting point in time where there is an administration in Iraq that wants the U.S. there. There is an administration in the U.S. that wants to be in Iraq uh, and is using the counter ISIS operations as their main point going forward. But we're definitely at a pivotal point in time where things may change very, very quickly in the next year. Right. Okay. We are unfortunately um, out of time. We're right at the top of the hour. So I have to cut it off there. Um, Thank you so much um, 
to Mike, Vladimir, and Devorah for being such great panelists. Um, I think we covered a, a tremendous amount of territory. This is an ongoing issue, um, so I would encourage you to um, to follow Mike's um, Militia Spotlight Tracker, which is now making its way around Washington and the U.S. government um, because it's hard to catalog these things, and Mike's team does a great job of that. Vladimir's reporting from the field, I think, has really been excellent and also very timely. And again, check out his FICRA Forum um, uh, article. Uh, Devorah's uh, attention to to the Islamic State in the midst of the Gaza crisis, um, I think, is uh, challenging from a number of different standpoints, but it's something that we're keeping up with um, uh, here at the Institute. Uh, but I think the the over my overall closing remark would be, um, in getting back to what Mike was talking about, the rules of the game, it's in Syria where the rules of the game um, uh, are, 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 are tacit. Uh, they're not set, uh, whereas opposed to places like Lebanon, we have well-enforced uh, thresholds um, that, uh, that cross-border attacks, which have occurred, can occur and not lead to all-out war, right? In Syria, it's more malleable. Um, we have five different militaries oper at least operating in that space, and it depends on how you look at the, all the different Iranian militias and their agendas. So a lot of it could be an interesting area of um, of escalation, intended or otherwise, uh, as a result of the Gaza crisis and uh, its potential to go regional. Um, so thanks to everybody. Thanks to the Washington Institute. Thanks to all of you for tuning in, and we will see you. Uh, online at the next policy forum. Thank you.